Hey guys, Tyler here. The warp drive is a core technology in Star Trek that enables faster than light travel. It makes interstellar civilization, exploration, and commerce possible. And by the 24th century, it is the primary means of interstellar transport throughout the Milky Way. But as we see, while humans invent it for ourselves in the mid-21st century, various cultures have had warp technology for much longer. Traveling faster than light would normally violate the laws of physics and Einstein's theory of general relativity, but some theoretical physicists believe that there may be ways to get around that. The question is, however, could we build something like a warp engine in real life? Today I'll attempt to answer this and other questions. Let's get started. Before we can explore the prospect of breaking the light barrier in our world, let's first get a better grasp on how warp drives operate in Star Trek. While the original series does provide some fundamental details about how warp drives function, more attention is given to the process in the Next Generation era and beyond. Starfleet warp engines, at least, are fueled by a matter-antimatter reaction. The matter in this reaction is deuterium, a stable isotope of hydrogen that, in addition to the single proton that characterizes normal hydrogen, contains a single neutron as well. Thus, deuterium is sometimes called heavy hydrogen. You may remember from science class, or if not there, then maybe YouTube or Wikipedia or somewhere else, that when matter and antimatter collide, they tend to annihilate each other, producing a nuclear explosion. This is where dilithium crystals, which regulate the matter-antimatter reaction, come into play. Whereas in real life, dilithium is a gaseous molecule composed of two lithium atoms, in Star Trek, dilithium is a full-fledged crystalline element that is part of the so-called hypersonic series. Since real lithium, being a metal, cannot form solid diatomic molecules, one explanation given in Star Trek is that dilithium has a subspace component that keeps it stable despite its high atomic weight. Possibly the reason it it can't be synthesized or replicated. As far as I can tell, the closest we come to being given an atomic number and weight for this element is 119 and 315 respectively, from the Starfleet Medical Reference Manual. The novel's Prime Directive and Firestorm also confirm dilithium's quartz-like structure and identify 2-3% of Earth's quartz as being useful for regulating the antimatter reaction in warp cores. In canon, we know that natural deposits of dilithium exist throughout the galaxy, and its rarity thus makes it a highly valuable substance. Dilithium crystals are non-reactive with antimatter when exposed to high-frequency electromagnetic fields. And as you may remember from my phasers video, electromagnetic is one of the most difficult words for me to say, so if I pronounce it like electromagnetic, it's just, it is what it is. This reaction produces a highly energetic plasma called warp plasma, which is funneled by plasma conduits through the electroplasma system, or EPS. The EPS also provides the primary energy supply for the ship's other electronic systems. For propulsion, plasma injectors funnel plasma into a series of warp field coils, usually located in the warp nacelles, the cylindrical structures located behind the saucer section and connected by pylons to the secondary hull. These coils are typically composed of a cast of the fictitious metal vertarium cortinide, a dense alloy of silica-based polymers and crystals, and the cast surrounds a tungsten cobalt magnesium core. The coils then create a subspace displacement field around a starship, allowing it to travel at warp speed. This field also has the physical effect of reducing the inertial mass of any object within its volume. It's this displacement field that honestly forms the crux of why warp drive is even effective as a faster-than-light propulsion method. As we are reminded by the 2009 Star Trek film, it's not really the ship itself that's moving faster than light, because that's impossible, but rather space itself. 
Kinda. According to special relativity, because the speed of light in a vacuum is the same for all observers, in order to preserve causality, no information or material object can travel faster than light. The speed of light, c, or 186,000 miles per second, is effectively the cosmic speed limit. But this isn't to say that nothing can happen faster than light. In fact, the expansion of space-time itself under cosmic inflation can and does happen faster. This is why the radius of the observable universe is over 46 billion light years, even though the universe itself is only 13.8 billion years old. And the whole universe, beyond our cosmic horizon, is possibly trillions of light years across. So by taking advantage of the fact that space can expand and theoretically contract, a warp drive can allow an object to coast along the subspace distortion to reach its destination intact. The object would bypass the effects of time dilation, which general relativity says all objects traveling near the speed of light experience. That said, we do sometimes see the ship's chronometers correct for small variations, just as satellites orbiting the Earth do. And indeed, on occasion, we do see Starship crews take advantage of the normal space-time properties inside warp bubbles to connect the warp fields of two different ships such as in the Enterprise episode, Divergence. But the problem with all of this, even the creation of a stable warp field in the first place, is that such a process would require lots of energy. More energy, frankly, than we've been able to harness at once in the entire lifetime of our civilization. This leads to another question. Are warp drives even theoretically possible? And if they are, are they practical? Before we can talk about skirting the laws of physics, let's first establish how fast we've been able to go with our current technology. It should come as no surprise that in the present day, the fastest speed we've been able to achieve with any man-made object is, well, much, much slower than the speed of light. Shocking, I know. The fastest object that we have ever built is the Parker Solar Probe, launched by NASA in 2018. In February 2020, Parker set a record when it reached a speed of 244,255 miles per hour. And about a year and a half later, according to Guinness World Records, it broke its own record by traveling at 364,660 miles per hour. And yet, this is only 0.0005% the speed of light. Think of how fast a helicopter or a bullet train is, okay? Now, that's a thousand times slower than the Parker Solar Probe, which itself is 2,000 times slower than the Phoenix, humanity's first warp vessel as seen in Star Trek First Contact. So we've got a long way to go before we can build a warp drive, but that hasn't stopped real-world theoretical physicists from speculating about how we could build one. Arguably the most popular faster-than-light engine concept outside of pure science fiction is the Alcubierre drive. Named after physicist Miguel Alcubierre, this speculative drive would mimic the expansion and contraction of space-time like in Star Trek by creating a negative energy density field. Though this method is consistent with Einstein's field equations, there are other hurdles. Creating an energy density field below that of the vacuum requires this little thing called negative mass, a type of exotic matter. That's right, we're going there. Now, exotic matter might sound too good to be true, but broadly speaking, it is a thing. Dark matter, for example, falls under this category, as do various particles and rare states of matter that have either been experimentally confirmed or are otherwise in line with the standard model. In fact, Alcubierre has suggested that the Casimir vacuum, a region of negative pressure density produced by the Casimir effect, which arises from quantum fluctuations in elementary particle fields, could fulfill the energy requirements necessary for a warp drive. 
This argument follows the same principles as analyses by other physicists regarding traversable wormholes. Some research has even claimed that the Alcubierre drive could be powered with purely positive energy through the use of soliton waves, which retain their shape even while propagating at a constant velocity. That said, other physicists have argued that a complete theory of quantum gravity, which combines general relativity with quantum mechanics, would eliminate the possibility of things like backwards time travel and other weird effects, including the artificial space-time curvature associated with warp drives. One fact that does make this all worth it, though, is that Alcubierre's hypothetical warp drive concept was directly inspired by Star Trek, which he has been open about ever since his original 1994 article detailing his hypothesis. So there you go. Star Trek always has and will continue to inspire real people to push the boundaries of science. Thank you all so much for watching. No, okay, yeah, not, not yet, not yet. Okay, back down to Earth. To say that the Alcubierre drive relies on an ability to manipulate matter, energy, and space-time far beyond our current capabilities is a huge understatement. But in recent years, researchers have concluded that the amount of energy necessary to power such a thing is no longer thought to be unobtainably large, quote unquote, as in more energy than the combined mass of the observable universe. As per his paper titled Warp Mechanics 101, Harold G. White recalculated the Alcubierre concept in 2011. He proposed that if the warp bubble around a spacecraft were shaped like a torus, or donut, it would be significantly more energy efficient and would thus make the whole concept closer to feasible. White's team followed up in 2012 with another study that showed that by modifying the geometry of exotic matter, the mass energy requirement for a macroscopic starship could be even further reduced from the equivalent mass of the planet Jupiter down to that of the Voyager 1 spacecraft, or Voyager 6 if you're more Star Trek inclined. That's progress right there. The study demonstrated, however, that focusing less energy into a larger volume would leave less flat space for the spacecraft to inhabit, meaning logically the spacecraft would have to be smaller. This is actually in line with what we see in Star Trek, more or less, with warp-capable ships getting bigger over time as technology improves, effectively a reverse of the process of miniaturization. Regardless, Alcubierre has expressed skepticism at this idea, saying this specific method of creating a larger warp bubble with less energy cannot be done, probably not for centuries, if at all. In fact, this could be applied to the entire concept of warp drives. The idea that we will break this barrier in the 21st century is highly unlikely, given everything that we currently know. Some believe we may not break the light speed barrier for another thousand years. Some say it might not be for another million years. And of course, the Alcubierre drive has lots of other difficulties that make it violate various energy conditions. Some believe a warp journey could only work if a vessel's entire path were curved ahead of time, with such infrastructure being likened to a railroad. This is why Star Wars has pre-mapped hyperspace lanes, for example. Others believe that anything inside a warp bubble would be vaporized by Hawking radiation. Even if we can build starships that run on fusion power or even antimatter, journeys to other stars may still be limited to a number of years rather than weeks, days, or minutes. Proponents argue it is possible, however, to bypass several of these problems by taking advantage of quantum mechanical phenomena, like the Casimir effect. Scientists have long proposed experiments to create small warp bubbles in the lab, which to me signals that we definitely should not give up hope just yet. So to answer the question, could we build a warp drive? Well. Likely not this century, maybe not even this millennium, but eventually? Perhaps. 
Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and engage.